the risk that China creates for the United States, particularly with regard to semiconductors. I remember you saying that, that the future resource wars of the future aren't going to be fought over oil. They're going to be fought over semiconductors and microchips and, and all the resources necessary for that. And yet, it doesn't seem like we're doing very much about that. We've basically offshored nearly all production of that sort of stuff. And then giving up Afghanistan, we give China access to rare earth minerals that they certainly did not have before. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I feel like the, the long-term risk of China is actually a lot lower than the short-term risk of China. Maybe because the short-term risk of China is, is, is higher because their long-term risk is, is lower. I mean, is their population, grow, their, their population situation is unsustainable? They know that. Their financial situation is not sustainable. They know that. But that's probably why they're getting very aggressive, I would think. Right. Oh, yes. I'm, I mean, I think this is a key issue. China is clearly past its peak. The growth rate is going to come down pretty rapidly, not just because of demographics, but because of the, the debt burdens that have been accumulated. I mean, if 29% if of economic activity is real estate, your business model is essentially tower blocks for nobody, as opposed to bridges to nowhere. And although I don't think there'll be some epic financial crisis a la Lehman Brothers, because that much the Chinese leadership knows to avoid, I still think they're on a path to being Japan, but at a lower per capita income level. But that's just why the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is more likely to take strategic risk uh, in the short run, because Xi Jinping knows that he is in a dangerously Gorbachev-like situation. He knows that it's got harder and harder to reform the Chinese economy, just as it was impossible to reform the Soviet economy by the 1980s. Now it's impossible to reform the Chinese economy. Too many vested interests, parties too much involved. It's, it's actually an unfixable system. I mean, our system has all kinds of problems, but it's quite fixable. We have the self-repair function, and I don't think they do. So it's clear that, that she is going to base the legitimacy of the party more and more on nationalism because that's all they've got. And that seems to me to point in the direction of a showdown over Taiwan. Not this year. This year they're going to be kind of busy teeing up uh, his third term uh, as leader for life. But the Taiwan issue is going to be the issue, I would say, of 2023. And that's a semiconductor story. I mean, Taiwan is TSMC HQ. TSMC is the cutting edge company for semiconductors. Most of their capacity is still there. So in Cold War II, which I think we're in, it's sort of Cuba meets the Persian Gulf meets Berlin. And that is troubling to me because ultimately, after pandemics, wars are the thing that really kill a lot of people prematurely, historically. And we haven't had a really big war for a while. Now, you could be Steve Pinker and say, there isn't going to be another big war because trends, but then Steve Pinker said that about pandemics in Enlightenment now and took the bears uh, uh, with Martin Rees that there wouldn't be one. Uh, so I'm not inclined to, to take that, that bet that there'll never be another really big war. In fact, I think we're much closer to another really big war than most civilians want to face because we got used to small wars. Afghanistan and Iraq were small wars in terms of the numbers of people who fought them and the numbers of people who died in them and even the amount they cost, though they were pretty expensive. But a war over Taiwan would be a whole different, a whole different deal. Well, this is a, do you think that the, the West would even do anything over Taiwan? I mean, the West did nothing over Hong Kong, obviously, and they violated every treaty guarantee they'd ever made to the British government, and, and nobody batted an eye when they just took Hong Kong and ingested it completely and imprisoned all of the dissidents. So I, I, I wonder whether, I mean, I, I think that that is what raises the risk of a greater war, is because eventually, I, I keep saying this on my show, but I feel like when it comes to foreign policy, everybody on the other side is Hans Gruber from Die Hard, and they're sitting there going, eventually I'm gonna get to somebody you do care about. We keep saying, okay, so we don't care about Ukraine. You know, take, take some, Ukraine. No, no big deal. Take some of Hong Kong, take Taiwan. But eventually, it'll be China threatening Australia, and then it'll be like, okay, well, are we willing to sit by while China is cutting off the shipping lanes around, around Australia? I mean. They, it seems like they have no real incentive not to do that because they have to keep ingesting territory and they have to keep ingesting resources because their economy is a, is a failure. I think the, the scenario that's most likely is not so much one based on resources. I think it's more that the legitimacy of Xi Jinping as leader depends on resolving, quote unquote, the Taiwanese anomaly. And it is an anomaly. It's not like Hong Kong, remember, because Taiwan uh, is in this ambiguous uh, situation in which uh, we pretend, and this has been true since 
the time of Kissinger. We kind of pretend that it's okay for them to say that it's part of China, but in practice, it's an autonomous democracy. And we have, since the legislation of 1979, a commitment to keep it that way and not to accept any change in its status that is forcible. So I think it's very, very different indeed. It's hard for me to imagine that any administration could simply acquiesce if the Chinese decided to invade Taiwan. Uh, and if an administration did acquiesce in such a takeover, that would be it. That would be game over for American primacy in the Indo-Pacific region, and I think pretty much everywhere else too. So I think it's not Hong Kong. I, I think it's problematic because, and this reminds me of other major geopolitical crises, we have on the one hand a commitment but on the other hand, a diminishing credibility of that commitment. I don't think the US can at this moment really deter China from taking that military risk if it wanted to, because we no longer have the dominance, particularly in naval terms, that we had, say, in the 1990s. So Taiwan Strait crisis is a nightmare for the Pentagon because they know that it'd be extremely difficult for us to do anything about it. They know that the Taiwanese in their own with their own resources wouldn't be able to do much about it. So we are in this very, very dangerous moment where you can see how the incentive is growing for Xi to do this. We know that he regards it as the capstone of his entire career, the thing that gets him into Mao Zedong uh, territory in terms of his historical significance. We know that it's his ultimate goal, he said that. But we also know that the time frame within which he can achieve it is finite. Because if we really decide to, to beef up Taiwan's deterrence, if we're serious about things like the Quad uh, with Japan, Australia and India, if we're serious about AUKUS with the Australians and the Brits, then his room to do this is not limitless. And that's the kind of thing that leads to conflicts historically.